We recently took our RV on a 4,000 mile trip to Yellowstone National Park. And boy, did we learn a lot along the way. We're going to share with you some tips and tricks that we learned on our trip so that you don't make the same mistakes that we did. So if you've seen our videos on our trip to Yellowstone, you know that we broke down not once, but twice along the way. And we could have saved ourselves a lot of money if we had one tool available to us. And that is an onboard diagnostic reader or OBD. An OBD is a vehicle diagnostic scanner. You plug it into your vehicle and it can be used to read error data from the system. If we had one of these, we would have known our spark plug wire went bad. It's important whenever you take a long RV trip that you have spare parts. Things like additional hoses, some screws, some tape in case you get a leak, a water pump, and fuses. Yes. Just little items to make it easier so that if you break down, you actually have you have them right on board your rig. Now, if you are coming from the East Coast and taking Interstate 90 like we did because we wanted to stop at places like Wall Drug and Mount Rushmore. And the Badland. Getting gas in South Dakota was fairly easy. Every few exits, we could find a gas station. But once we hit Wyoming, it was hard. Those exits were far apart, and most of them didn't have any kind of service area. So what we recommend is that you fill up at every opportunity once you hit Wyoming. Yes. And once you get off of 90, stop at a gas station in Buffalo, because that's the last major town, I think, that you go through before you hit Bighorn, and there are no gas stations all the way through Bighorn. No, there aren't. And we drove for a good two hours before we saw a gas station. Right, and I think the next one was Cody. We burned over half a tank before we hit another gas station. Yes, we did. A lot of that was due to the hilly nature of the terrain out there before we got to um, Yellowstone. Which brings me to another point. If you're coming from the East Coast like we did, you may want to plan an alternate route other than going through Bighorn National Forest. Oh yes, you might want to go around that. But if you are adventurous and you just want to see what it's like and you still want to do that like we did, be sure that you know how to drive your RV in manual mode. Our brakes overheated uh, on the way down. On the downside, going into the valley after we got through the mountains. And we had our RV in tow haul mode. We did. But what we didn't realize is that instead of using our brakes, we should have been downshifting. We should have been downshifting. You want to be sure when you're going down the hills to use manual mode. And to use manual mode, you take your shifter, move it from drive, one step over to manual, and you use the plus and minus to up and down shift going down those steep hills. Just check out your vehicle see what you have, and if you have the ability to downshift, definitely do that. That would have helped a lot. Another tip that we have is that you never want to arrive at Yellowstone after dark, oh. and there are a number of different reasons for that. One, the roads are small, and they're very curvy, and there are lots of animals that come out at night. So it becomes very dangerous because your chances of hitting something increases as it gets darker so it's better just to take that stop rest up if you're not going to make it there before it gets dark and then head on in the next morning which brings me to our next tip what's that our next tip is that the roads going to yellowstone can be icy and snowy even in the summertime that was a surprise for me. We traveled to Yellowstone in mid-June, yeah. and there was snow on the road. There was. There was snow on the, on, on the ground there yes. going toward Fishing Bridge. So that's another reason why you don't want to travel at after dark, because the, as the elevation changes, the weather changes, and you have to be prepared for that. Okay, so now we're going to talk about our two least favorite states on our journey to Yellowstone. Oh my gosh. The two states I think that put the most stress on our RV were Colorado and Illinois. Oh yes, Illinois wasn't great, but Colorado was horrible. Look, I'm sorry out there. I have to say this. 
Colorado really messed up our RV. Those roads were horrible. In my opinion, they were the worst I've ever driven on. Uh, they were very, very bumpy. My driver's side mirror started swinging around. It just completely came loose. And a lot of other things, like our wood trim started coming off here inside the coach. And the, my TST tire minder kept falling off the dash because it was just rattled to death. It's just don't, don't forget, our, our dinette booth <laughs> fell yes. apart as well. And there was something underneath the RV. We had some a cable tie under there, and it was held in place by this metal bracket and the metal bracket just wore all the way through it just couldn't handle it oh yes illinois wasn't great but colorado was horrible so our tip is make sure that you tighten all your screws <laughs> before you leave that you take your time through both colorado and illinois because those roads were very very bumpy they were and when you get to your first stop after you leave those states just do a thorough check to make sure that everything is still in one piece. Yes, make sure everything's secure. That was pretty bad. <laughs> it was. Which brings us to the next tip. Make sure you have your tools with you. You're probably yes. going to need them. You are. Now, due to our experiences out there with the two breakdowns, we now understand the importance of having the number of your roadside assistants and the number of the company that built the chassis that your RV rides on, you're probably going to need those at some point in time. So we limped along to three different gas stations before we finally found a place that could actually take a look and work on our RV. What I really wish we had known and remembered is that Fleetwood has roadside assistance, Ford has roadside yeah. assistance. If we had had those numbers handy, we could have called them and somebody would have probably come out to us. Maybe, maybe not, I'm not sure. Maybe it would have meant to tow somewhere, but at least they could have pointed us in the right direction to a maintenance facility that would have been able to do work in our RV. Yeah. Which brings me to our next point is if you have in particular a class A RV, I'm not as familiar with class C RV, so I don't know if this is the case as well, but with a class A RV like ours, which is a gas RV, you must know how to remove your doghouse. Yes. We were very fortunate that we had just done a video on how to quiet the engine because we wanted to travel with less noise on this Yellowstone trip. So we had figured out how to remove and how to replace the doghouse. And when we finally got to Charlie's, which is the shop that did the diagnostic for right. us on our RV, they didn't know how to remove our doghouse, so we had to do that, which was fine. We didn't mind doing it, but imagine if that was the first time oh. we had ever taken it apart. We could have been there a long time, a long time because, doing that. Yeah, that first time took me a while. And it wasn't like we were like, you know, in a highly populated area where we had a great cell signal and we can do research on YouTube videos, which by the way, there weren't any YouTube videos out there on how to remove our particular dog house. No, they weren't. Right. Um, but you know, it just, it, you're already stressed out and having to figure that out would have just added to it. It would have. Yeah, so you don't, just make sure, do a practice run, make sure you know how to do it, watch some videos. Um, it really isn't that hard, but at least you'll know how. Because you can't guarantee that whoever can help you while you're on the road or do the diagnostics will actually know how to expose your engine. Right. So we um, didn't have a lot of vacation time. That was my fault. That was his fault for this trip. So we wanted to maximize our time in Yellowstone. So our plan was one night um, at each rest stop. So we traveled 10 hour days, stayed one night, got up early in the morning, yep. got back on the road with the exception of Kemp's Camp in yes. Keystone, South Dakota, because we wanted to see the Badlands and we wanted to see Mount Rushmore. Right. That was a lot. That was a lot. By the time we got, by the time we went from Indiana to Minnesota to Kemp's Camp in South Dakota, I was ready for a break. We all were. We needed that two nights out there. I understand that like sometimes you don't have a choice, but if you can at least spend more time, like maybe either every other night if you have to get there, right? Um, you, you will appreciate it because it's, it gets very stressful doing it any other way. 
especially if you get to a campsite that you really find you love and you want to spend time there, you know. And you can't. You can't. But you know what, John? Um, I must say, though, I don't think it would have been as stressful for us if we didn't break down. Right. I think you're if right. If we didn't have those issues. But then you never know what can happen. No. You just don't know when you're traveling. So it also gives you the opportunity to make sure everything's okay with your RV. It does. On the flip side, I highly recommend on the way back home that you spend, that you take your time and not spend one night everywhere you go to. Which That's we right. did. We went to see Canyonland, so we spent two nights there. We did. But I really wish we had more time in lots of places that we visited. Especially that one that you really liked in Utah. I loved Utah. Let's talk about some of our tips in the park. We stayed at Fishing Bridge RV Park, which is owned by Santerra. We made our reservations one year in advance. Now, I, I don't know at the time that you're watching this video, it may or may not be as difficult to get a reservation, but we were online at midnight Wyoming time, and we we're on the East Coast, so that we could book that reservation. I did find that over that year, spots did open up, yes, but I didn't did. find any that opened up for a full week for the size of our RV. Now we have a 36 foot RV and we were able to find quite a few stories. I think there were quite a few spaces when I did it yes. up there and most of the spots, they were pretty big. If you haven't been to Fishing Bridge lately, it has been completely redone and it has cement pads yes. and they were very, very level. And it even has bison or two that like to come and visit and munch on the flowers that are there. Now, when you're at Fishing Bridge, there are no bear boxes. So whatever you decide to cook on the outside, whether you have a black stone, a solo stove or charcoal grill, has to be brought back inside as soon as you're done cooking. So as soon as you know your black stone cools off, for example, you've got to pack it up yep. and you've got to put it back inside. We found that to be quite the inconvenience. So we did most of our cooking on the inside because we, we wanted to be able to come back, grab a bite, and then maybe go out and do something later on. Now, each of the campground areas in Yellowstone, they do have grocery stores. Oh yes. And we were kind of surprised at the selection in these grocery stores, you can buy fruits, vegetables, cereals, meats, meats, yes, yeah, lunch meat. meats, bread, Bacon. snacks. <laughs> I mean, they, it, it, it wasn't cheap. No. Right? It wasn't cheap. Yeah. But a lot of stuff when we went out that way wasn't cheap, but it wasn't cheap. But there was a lot that you could actually buy. So if you need to resupply and you're going into the park or you run out of stuff or you forgot something, most likely you can find it at one of the supermarkets inside of Yellowstone. And for most of Fishing Bridge, it is, um, you could actually walk there. Oh, yeah, you could walk yeah, to the... Yeah, you could walk to the general store. And um, not only is there a grocery store, there's a gift shop. Yeah. And a, uh, there's a grocery store, there's a gift shop, there's a uh, shopette, sort of like a little convenience store, and a gas station, too. And a service station attached to it that works on RVs. Oh, that's right. And I think each of the villages, as they called them, yes. had something like that. Something it did. very similar. It did, yes, they did. Yeah. So if you get there and you're having problems, they might be able to help you out. The water pressure at Fishing Bridge is set very high. When we were there, the water was measured at 75 PSI. We were instructed to put a pressure regulator on the faucet then go inside, open our faucets in the rig before we actually open the valves on the regulator. And to open those valves slowly when we did. Quite a few mishaps. Oh. People who uh, didn't follow those steps and the water just kind of whoosh, everywhere. Oh, wow. So let's talk a little bit about the change in elevation and oh, yeah. what that can do when you're coming from an area that is at a lower elevation. Yes, well, that was something that affected me. I have asthma, so we got up there, and because of the elevation, the air is slightly thinner, so it was a little bit uh, harder to breathe up there. It's not that difficult. It just makes you feel a little off. So we wouldn't recommend, if you're coming from a lower elevation and going to Yellowstone, that you start your first day off with a six mile hike, let's say, for yeah. example. You wanna give your body a chance to acclimate 
to the thinner air. I mean, John has asthma, I don't. And I wasn't as affected, but I right. could still tell the difference that the air was a bit thinner. Yeah. And one of the things that you can do, and, and I didn't realize this before we went, but there are actually cans of oxygen that you can purchase. They do sell at Yellowstone cans of oxygen where you can actually breathe into them yep. and get that oxygen fix you might need. So, And you can also buy them from Amazon or REI. Places like that will sell them as well. I will say Yellowstone had some excellent camping stores. They did, didn't they? They had all kinds of great gear. They had everything from hiking shoes to clothing to walking sticks to camp stoves to just all any kind of accessory you might need while you were there. It was very easy to find, not just by the campgrounds, but just in all the gift shops, whatever right. you might need. With the higher elevation comes different weather patterns as well. We went to Yellowstone, as we said before, in the middle of June, and there was snow on the way in. Not only was there snow on the way in, but our second day there, it snowed. <laughs> So, and it's really kind of weird because you can have nice warm weather or comfortable weather, maybe like 60s, 70s yeah. during the day, and then it will drop down below 32 degrees at night. And so you have to be prepared for those changing Yellowstone weather patterns. Oh my gosh. So we highly recommend that, and, and I know this is a lot to pack. Right. Bring your winter clothes, <laughs> bring your <laughs> summer clothes, or... You know, just wear layers as you go out each yeah, day. Yeah, layers would be good. You know, we had on t-shirts, and then we might have had a long, a long sleeve, uh, like a sweatshirt or something over oh, that, and then yes. a light jacket. So that, and, and of course, we had a backpack so that we could shed our layers yeah. um, as the day progressed because the morning was cool. Cool. By, you had ice on your car one morning. <laughs> by midday, it gets warmer, and then by the evening when it gets dark, it's cold again. And that's why Yellowstone closes in the winter. Let's talk about seeing the animals. Oh my gosh, yes. Now, I didn't realize this until we went to Grand Teton. Right. But this same strategy works in Yellowstone as well. And I wish I had seen a video because some people go to Yellowstone, they see tons of wildlife. Yeah. Other people go to Yellowstone and they don't see anything. They see just a few bison, you know, maybe a bear or two from a very long distance. Yep. If you want to see animals at Yellowstone, here's what you do. Grab your cell phone. Grab your cell phone. Grab your cell phone. <laughs> I think she wants you to grab your cell phone. Go to your Maps app. When it looks at your location, look for the red lines. <laughs> the red lines where there is tons of traffic. Now, there was some construction and the construction right. caused some of those red lines. Yeah. But where there are red lines on your map app, I don't care if it's Google or, or Apple or whatever, there are animals because yes. everybody stops to see the animals when they show on the side of the road. Yes, they do. And that causes the traffic in the road to slow down because they say, what are these people looking at? And so whenever we saw that, once we got to tea time, we learned this kind of late. Once we got to tea time, we'd see a red line and say, let's go there. And we'd go there, and sure enough, there were animals. animals. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise! Traffic jam! <laughs> Traffic jams mean animals, animals at Yellowstone. We downloaded, before we left, an app called Guide Along. The app is free, but you do have to pay for the areas you want to use the Guide Along. So ah, we, yes. paid for Nash we paid for Yellowstone and Grand Teton, that came together. And then we also paid for, we went to Arches afterwards. Yeah. And it wasn't very expensive. I think it was something like $19. I'll put it down here somewhere, how much it was. What Guide Along does is that it works off of your GPS, right? So it doesn't need um, cellular service. It kind of like downloads all this stuff. I think maybe only once it didn't work. Right, and I don't Maybe remember where so. we were. We were like someplace think, really remote. Was it Moab? I don't. I'm not sure where it was. But okay. anyway, it was it was great because you know we planned out places we wanted to go. But the nice thing about Guide Along is that it took us to places we didn't know we wanted to go. <laughs> yes, it did. 
And as you drive through the park, it tells you different stories about the area that you're in. It gives you some of the history. It says, hey, you may want to pull off over here because X, Y, and Z. I love the cool little historical stories about people or things that have happened in that location. Yeah, it was it was really great. Um, so we, we highly recommend that if you're going, go ahead and get this app. It's not that much. Mm -mm. It tells you everything because there's no way you're going to know everything about the park. Oh, no. And it was just such a useful tool. It was. I mean, when you're coming up on something, it would describe what it is, tell you about it, and it would say, coming up on the right the next turn, you know, if you yep. wanted to take it. Yep. And it's not just for Yellowstone. It's like, it has it for all the national parks, which is really kind of cool. We all know that Yellowstone has bears. If you've seen any of my videos, you know I am terrified of bears. Yes. And while you are allowed to bring weapons into Yellowstone, you are not allowed to discharge them. And you're allowed to bring a weapon because a lot of hunters travel through Yellowstone to get to approved hunting areas yes right so if you discharge that firearm against the bear you're in a lot of trouble especially if it's a grizzly because it's a protected animal right. and you're also breaking the law by discharging that we know so what you need to make sure that you have when you're at yellowstone is a good quality bear spray now we chose the larger one because i'm terrified of, <laughs> of seeing a bear and we did see a bear. We did. Okay. Well, I did. This is the one that we used while we were in Yellowstone. And this one has 10.2 ounces. There are others that are smaller. And these things will attach to your backpack or to your belt. Right. Um, this case, some of them come with the case. You can purchase different weight, different cases so that you can have it ready. If you're on a hike, talk loudly. We were in a group and everyone just kind of talked loudly. Yeah. And you know, if they hear you, the one thing they don't, you don't want to do is surprise them. Right. Right. So some people get little bear bells and they put it on their shoes. Yes. Or, you know, they get a whistle and they blow it every so often, but just talking loudly will for the most part, keep the bears away too. Yeah, you just don't want to shock them because you don't know how they'll act if they get scared. If you want to see Old Valley Food, get there very early or get there at dinner time. Yes, it gets very crowded very fast. And there are some places, during, depending on time of day, uh, you'll go to because they have different areas around the park that are of interest. And some of those got pretty crowded, too. Leaving early, heading out early, really worked well for us. It did. And if you want to know what time uh, some of the geysers will erupt, go to the visitor center, and they yeah. have the times listed right there yes. so that you can kind of plan out your, your day and what you want to do. And just so you know, Old Faithful, while it is the most regular geyser, is not the biggest geyser. No, it's not. And remember, the times you get are not precise. They're plus or minus 15, I believe. And it was pretty good. I think we had one that was five minutes late. Yes. Now, another thing we discovered, once the Yellowstone Teton area gets warmed up, let's say in the 60s, 70 range, they have the largest mosquitoes I've seen, and there's so many of them. They're everywhere. But usually it stays too cool for them. But if it gets warm, like a couple of days we had, it get warm. Be prepared for lots, lots of mosquitoes. Lots of They're mosquitoes. everywhere. I also want to talk a little bit more about the other campers that you will find in the RV parks at Yellowstone. <laughs> we, have, we, saw, we saw more RV rentals there than we have ever seen anywhere we have ever gone. And with that comes a lot of inexperienced RVers, right. people who are, you know, doing this just this one time so they can go see Yellowstone. Yes. So you'll have to be patient because they are not very aware of RV etiquette. No, they're not. We had a lot of situations where people just didn't follow those rules yes. of, of how you should, um, you know, they didn't realize you shouldn't cross through someone else's site. Yeah. Um, their kids were quite regularly playing on our grass. Yes, you know? they were. And, you know, when we saw that, it was usually people that were coming from the rental RVs. Yes. And another thing is they're mostly Class Cs, which are still pretty big. But they were driving them around the park like they were cars. They were. And so you have to also be very careful of that as well and we do not recommend unless you have a class b 
or what is sometimes referred to as a Class B+, plus, which is a very small Class C RV. Yes. We really recommend that you have a car to drive around the parks. Yes. Some of the roads are narrow, and actually some of the roads prohibit RVs from traveling on them. So you will limit what you can do if your plan is to drive your RV everywhere you go. If you can tow a vehicle, I highly recommend you do that. Now, that being said, each location of interest around the park does have RV spaces, but they're very limited and small. And I need to mention, in spite of what it looks like on maps, Yellowstone is huge. There is no way you can see it all in one trip. It's just impossible because well, you can so if you're staying for a long time. Oh, you'd but have I to stay think, a long time. I think we would have been able to see all of Yellowstone if we stayed for two weeks and done everything that we wanted to do. Because, you know, we had days where we took, you know, long hikes. Yes. Like we, we walked most days over 10 miles. We did. We walked a lot. We did a lot of walking. It's because we wanted to see everything. Right. right. So if you have, like, two weeks, I think you can cover all of Yellowstone. At least two weeks, yeah. Yeah, and I think that where we were at Fishing Bridge, I was fine with driving to all those other locations rather than staying in one of the more primitive campgrounds right. that are, that's located there, which I should also mention that um, you no longer, I don't think Yellowstone any longer has those first come, first serve campground spaces. You have to yes. make a reservation now. You may you watch do. videos that say first come, first serve. Not anymore. Not anymore. You actually have to make a reservation there. And um, Fishing Bridge is located pretty centrally. It was uh, really convenient getting up north it was. And then also getting to Old Faithful. It was like maybe, what, 30-minute drive to Old Faithful at the most? At the most, yes. Yeah, so when you plan on your days, just play, okay, I'm going to do West Yellowstone on this day. I'll do North Yellowstone on that day. And, and then it works out fine. It really wasn't too bad. Yeah, it does. It, it, it works when you choose an area and stay in that area for the whole day. Make sure you pack a snack um, or you pack your lunch so that you can stay out for the whole day. Why? You can eat out in all the little villages all around the park. Yeah, well, yeah, if you want a lot of burgers and hot dogs <laughs> and things like that. The, the best selections of meals was at Canyon Village. That place was fantastic. It had like a little mall. Yes, it um, did. So if you're eating there. So those are our tips for Yellowstone. If you've been to Yellowstone, please go ahead and put your tips down in the comments below so that we can share this with everyone. And if you're going to Yellowstone, we hope you have an awesome adventure. It'll be great.